Hey church, hope you had a good Wednesday today. Hope you've enjoyed your day. Uh, thanks for joining us tonight as we walk through our midweek Bible study together as we continue our journey through the book of Acts. And uh, tonight we'll be in Acts chapter 15 as we enter Acts part 15. Um, and before we get going, I want to uh, invite you uh, to join us for worship either in person or online on Sunday. Um, uh, my plans and my family's plans have changed a little bit, so we'll be here this Wednesday. And uh, uh, we have something uh, different and uh, unique planned for Sunday in terms of our uh, preaching and worship time. And so I want to invite you to uh, to be a part of that. Um, as we think about um, where we are and where we've been and where we're going in the midst of a changing world and uh, things changing around us all the time. So I hope you can join us for that. I also want to invite you to pray for the folks on our prayer sheet. Uh, some of you may have already done that. Some of you may pause me and do that, and that's totally fine. Some of you might do that after after we get done tonight. Tonight, we're going to think about dealing with disputes. Obviously, if you've been around church very long, you realize that not everybody always agrees about everything, and that's true for any group of people. People have different ideas. People have different ways of looking at things. People people approach things differently. That, that's, that's not unusual. Um, unfortunately, sometimes churches... Uh, become known for not handling those things very well. And what we see here in Acts chapter 15 is a, is a dispute and how the early church deals with this. Um, there are some contemporary uh, denominations and churches that are very concerned with living life as a church exactly the way that the early church did. And certainly the early church has so many things to teach us about what it means to be a church but in so many ways, the early churches, well, they're kind of like us. They're figuring things out. They're working through uh, things that work and things that don't. They're working through uh, issues. They're working through challenges. They're working through disputes, just like, we, just like we're going to look at uh, here uh, today. When have you seen a dispute among Christians settled in a Christ-like way? And the follow-up question to that is, when have you seen a dispute among Christians settled badly. When have you seen it settled badly? Let's read uh, chapter 15 verses 1 through 11 to begin with. Then certain individuals came down from Judea and were teaching the brothers, unless you are circumcised according to the custom of Moses, you cannot be saved. And after Paul and Barnabas had no small dissension and debate with them, Paul and Barnabas and some of the others were appointed to go up to Jerusalem to discuss this question with the apostles and the elders. So they were sent on their way by the church, and as they passed through both Phoenicia and Samaria, they reported the conversion of the Gentiles and brought great joy to all the believers. When they came to Jerusalem, they were welcomed by the church and the apostles and the elders, and they reported all that God had done with them. But some believers who belonged to the sect of the Pharisees stood up and said, It is necessary for them to be circumcised in order to keep the law of Moses. The apostles and the elders met together to consider the matter. After there had been much debate, Peter stood up and said to them, My brothers, you know that in the early days God made a choice among you that I should be the one through whom the Gentiles would hear the message of the good news and become believers. And God, who knows the human heart, testified to them by giving them the Holy Spirit just as he did to us. And in cleansing their hearts by faith, he has made no distinction between them and us. Now, therefore, why are you putting God to the test by placing on the neck of the disciples a yoke that neither our ancestors nor we have been able to bear. On the contrary, we believe that we will be saved through the grace of the Lord Jesus, just as they will. So what, of course, is at stake in this controversy? They're adding something to the gospel, right? They're adding something for what it means for people to know Jesus. And what approach do believers in Antioch decide uh, to take to solve this issue? And then how does Peter present the case for his viewpoint. Picking it up again in verse 12, Luke records for us, the whole assembly kept silence and listened to Barnabas and Paul as they told of all the signs and wonders that God had done through them among the Gentiles. After they finished speaking, James replied, my brothers, listen to me. Simeon has related how God first looked favorably among the Gentiles to take from among them a people for his name. 
This agrees with the words of the prophets as it is written, After this I will return, and I will rebuild the dwelling of David, which has fallen from its ruins. I will rebuild it, and I will set it up, so that all other peoples may seek the Lord, even all the Gentiles over whom my name has been called. Thus says the Lord, who has been making these things known from long ago. Therefore I have reached the decision that we should not trouble those Gentiles who are turning to God, but we should write to them to abstain only from things polluted by idols and from fornication and from whatever has been strangled and from blood. For in every city for generations past, Moses has had those who proclaim him, for he has been read aloud, <clears throat> excuse me, been read aloud every Sabbath in the synagogues. Then the apostles and the elders, with the consent of the whole church, decided to choose men from among their members and to send them to Antioch with Paul and Barnabas. They sent Judas called Barsabbas and Silas leaders among the brothers with the following letter. And we'll pick that up in just a moment. How does the firsthand evidence here of Paul and Barnabas affect the discussion and the conclusions? It's interesting that what they really come down to is they think through this process, something that's new and strange for them. Uh, for these people to hear the, uh, about uh, circumcision not being uh, vital to a relationship with God, it's interesting that they point to a couple of different things. They point to scripture and they point to experience. They point to both of those things. And Paul and Barnabas especially recount for them the things that they have experienced, uh, the things that they've seen, the way the way that they've seen God move that, that they had never expected to happen before, that, that God is moving and doing and, and, and active in the world in new and fresh ways that they never imagined before. James, of course, uh, was apparently one of Jesus' brothers who had not believed in him during Jesus' public ministry. And Jesus had appeared to James in a separate and special occasion after uh, his resurrection. I think 1 Corinthians records that for us. And James had joined with the apostles in prayer. And we see that at the beginning of this letter, actually, from Luke. By all accounts, James became a prominent leader in the first generation of Christianity. Its judgment, summing up the debate and its results, is extremely important. James quotes what we just read. James quotes Amos 9, 11, and 12. And you can, you can go read that on your own. And I would encourage you to to read all of Amos, actually. Um, and the scripture, James says, has bearing on this controversy. James and the others work out uh, in Acts, uh, especially between verses 6 and 21, the double principle of needful circumcision on the one hand and no needless offense on the other. So the Gentiles who had believed in Jesus do not have to be circumcised. That is, they do not have to become Jewish in order to be Christian. There, there's not another step in the process. They are not in a separate category when it comes to salvation. But the Gentile Christians are to be encouraged not to offer needless slaps in the face to uh, their as yet unbelieving Jewish neighbors. They should keep well away, well away from various rituals involved in pagan worship, including, of course, and those are listed out, uh, the the drinking of blood, ritual prostitution, other elements that were assumed to be practiced at some, if not all, of the temples at the time. Um, and if anyone thinks this is some sort of compromise, it, it is not only a compromise which stands here in Scripture itself, but it is one for which uh, James himself argued for on the basis of Scripture from, from Amos chapter 9. Um, have you ever noticed how we struggle to, maybe Christians especially, I don't know, um, but how we struggle to be okay with the both ands in life. That's really what this is. Um, there's a group of people in the midst of this dispute that approached this dispute with an either or. It was either going to be this way or it was going to be that way. There was no in between. There was no neutral ground. There was no compromise. It's either going to be my way or that's it. And what Paul and Barnabas and James actually lead these groups to see is that there is a both and area here. There's a way for this to work out. There's a way to find compromise. There's a way for us to uh, to move forward and to not be stuck in this place. And it's so easy for us to get stuck, to get stuck. Um, let's, uh, let's pick it up again 
in, let's see, where did I leave off here? Uh, the middle of the, or the beginning of the letter, verse 23. The brothers, both the apostles and the elders, to the believers of Gentile origin in Antioch and Syria and Cilicia, greetings. Since we have heard that certain groups who have gone out from us, though with no instructions from us, have said things to disturb you and have unsettled your minds, we have decided unanimously to choose representatives and send them to you, along with our beloved Barnabas and Paul, who have risked their lives for the sake of our Lord Jesus Christ. We have therefore sent Judas and Silas, who themselves will tell you the same things by word of mouth. For it has seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us to impose on you no further burden than these essentials, that you abstain from what has been sacrificed to idols and from blood and from what is strangled and from fornication. If you keep yourselves from these, you will do well. Farewell. So they were sent off and went down to Antioch. When they gathered the congregation together, they delivered the letter. When its members read it, they rejoiced at the exhortation. Judas and Silas, who were themselves prophets, said much to encourage and strengthen the believers. After they had been there for some time, they were sent off in peace by the believers to those who had sent them. But Paul and Barnabas remained in Antioch, and there, with many others, they taught and proclaimed they taught and proclaimed the word of the Lord. The church in Antioch needed to know beyond all doubt that Paul had not simply written this letter himself and passed it off as some sort of official document. And so, of course, the, the church in Jerusalem takes these steps to confirm the authenticity of this letter. Um, it's interesting that the people who, as they hear this letter, the way that Luke records that is that they delight, they delight in the, in the hearing of this letter and in the reading of this letter. Um, and then they follow up on the instructions. They follow up on the instructions of that letter too. If you were paying attention there and following along in your Bible, you probably noticed that your Bible doesn't have a verse 34. Did you notice that? It doesn't have a verse 34 at all. Uh, those with sharp eyes probably s spotted that. Uh, the earliest and best manuscripts of the New Testament have the text as we now see it in our Bibles without that verse 34. Uh, but there's a little bit of a puzzle here. So Luke says that Judas and Silas returned to Jerusalem, but a few verses later in verse 40, Paul chooses Silas to go from Antioch on his next journey. So the question is, did Silas go back to Jerusalem or did he stay in Antioch? Uh, there's really no necessary contradiction. Paul could have very easily sent a message to Jerusalem calling Silas back to him, but at some point, Two scribes independently decided that they wanted to tidy up the story a little bit uh, and explain to provide some sort of explanation to what Silas did. And when the New Testament uh, verse numbering was added centuries later to this, this additional material that was added here that is not in our best and oldest manuscripts was still in the text people were using at the time and it was labeled as verse 34. And so today, all contemporary translations that I'm aware of uh, omit that. And, and so they just have omitted verse 34 altogether. And that's why there is no verse 34 uh, in chapter 15, in chapter 15 of Acts. Let's finish up the chapter. <clears throat> After some days, Paul said to Barnabas, Come, let us return and visit the believers in every city where we proclaim the word of the Lord and see how they're doing. Barnabas wanted to take with him John called Mark, but Paul decided not to take with them one who had deserted them in Pamphylia and had not accompanied them in the work. The disagreement became so sharp that they parted company. Barnabas took Mark with him and sailed away to Cyprus, but Paul chose Silas and set out the believers commending him to the grace of the Lord. He went through Syria and Cilicia, strengthening the churches. So a new controversy arises in Antioch. Um, they've made it through one. Now they've got another one. Um, and this is, uh, we, we, we know this today too about churches. Uh, they, they're, they're, there's things that they get hung up on. Um, or there's churches that just struggle to work through differences. And, and, and we see that, of course, in the New Testament too. Paul is... Um, very different in how he approaches the Corinthian church than how he approaches the church at Philippi. Uh, the way those two churches uh, seem to have worked through things and the way that they seem to have communicated and settled things are vastly different. And Antioch now has a new controversy that arises. So with one important dispute, Luke ironically follows with a more personal uh, difference of opinion that is not settled. 
Um, nonetheless, uh, there seems to, and what Luke what Luke says for us really um, is that that good seems to come out of Paul and Barnabas going two different uh, directions. Last week I shared something with you from uh, one of my favorite New Testament uh, theologians, N.T. Wright, and I want to share something again from from that he's written. As usual in this kind of thing, both both Paul and Barnabas were, in a sense, in the right. Paul was thinking back to all the opposition they had faced in Turkey. John Mark had not even made it to Turkey, but had gone back home from Cyprus. Paul knew he desperately needed people he could rely on totally, whatever happened. Barnabas, the son of encouragement living up to his name, could no doubt see that John Mark was only a youngster and that he had simply panicked on the previous trip. Giving John Mark a second chance would show the Jerusalem church that they, Paul and Barnabas, wanted to cement the partnership between Antioch and Jerusalem, which had been firmly and publicly established through the Jerusalem Council. Luke could quite easily have found a less embarrassing way of explaining the new missionary pairings. But anyone who suggests that Luke is trying to whitewash early church history or imply that the apostles were angels should think again. In fact, by including this unhappy episode, Luke adds credibility to all he has written. I have a hunch, N.T. Wright writes, that he told this shocking little story partly because he wanted this lesson to be heard and taken to heart, that God can take the greatest human folly and sin and bring great good from it. May we pray tonight for grace and for wisdom in settling disputes and settling arguments, whether they're ones that we are directly involved in or ones in which we are called to play the role of a mediator. And may we pray for anybody who we're in conflict with also. I want to encourage you once again as we wrap up tonight to join us on Sunday morning for a special time of worship and a special time of thinking together about who we are and where we're headed in the midst of a changing world. It's going to be a good Sunday, so I hope that you'll join us either uh, um, online or in person, and I look forward to seeing you. Let's, let's pray together, and uh, we'll be finished up for tonight. God, we thank you so much for this time together. We pray that you would uh, just be with those folks on our prayer list, not only them, but those who are on our hearts and on our minds. Pray, God, that you would bless them and provide for them and the needs that they're having in their lives. God, we thank you so much for all that you do for us. And we just pray, God, that you would help us to walk with grace and wisdom and truth as we uh, walk through life and as we need to walk through differences and sometimes disputes and, and arguments, that we might be able to do that with grace and truth, seeking and trying to make much of the name of Jesus as we do that. And it's in his name we pray. Amen. Have a good night, everybody. Good rest of the week. God bless you, and we'll see you on Sunday.